We've been looking at a lot of evidence that Lyell's millions of years don't exist, and the sedimentary rocks were all laid down very quickly about four and a half thousand years ago. But geologists put forward some evidence that they say proves the rock must be much older than that. There's the argument that it must have taken millions of years for the Colorado River to carve out the Grand Canyon. The rate of erosion today is just a few millimetres a year. The canyon is hundreds of metres deep, so it must have taken millions of years to erode. But in 1980, Mount St. Helens in America erupted. There was an earthquake which caused rock falls, steam blasts and mud flows. By the time the series of eruptions had finished, there were impressive erosion features. The North Fork of the Tootle River now flows in one of those features called Engineer's Canyon. But the river didn't make it. Catastrophic events gouged out this drainage channel and now the river flows in it. In the same way, the Grand Canyon was not carved out by the Colorado River at a few millimetres a year. In the Mount St. Helens eruption, about 600 feet of finely layered volcanic sediment formed in about one day. So much for Lyle three millimetres a century. And this observed rapid geological development was due to an eruption causing an earthquake of magnitude 5.1 on the Richter scale. The meteorite impact would have caused an earthquake at least 10 million times more powerful than that. Geologists also tell us there's evidence for ice ages in the geological record. Well, certainly there was an ice age not very long after the flood, and we've lots of evidence of U-shaped valleys, the characteristic feature of ice action. But within the record of the sedimentary rocks, we find no evidence for U-shaped valleys, or in fact, any kind of valley. So why do the geologists claim there were other ice ages? Well, they find scratches called striations. Striations can be caused by glaciers dragging boulders which scratch the rocks below. They also find unsorted till, which is stuff dropped by glaciers when they melt. But mud flows also drag along rocks which scratch the material below and they also dump unsorted till. Earthquakes cause mud flows. The meteorite impact, which the scientists tell us about, would have caused huge earthquakes. So to find striations and unsorted tills caused by fast-moving mud flows would not be anything unusual. There's no evidence that they were actually caused by ice. Another claim for vast amounts of time in the geological column is sand dunes. Sand dunes can form on the seabed when currents move the sand around, just like wind moving it around on land. But geologists usually claim these dunes were formed by wind in desert conditions and then ask, how could there be a desert in a worldwide flood? Arms and O'Keefe pointed out a tidal wave would result even if the meteorite hit land because the resulting quake, measuring 12 on today's Richter scale, would create an immense seismic sea wave. And remember, their calculations of three mile high waves were based on only a 10 kilometer meteorite, which NASA later said was actually 200 kilometers in diameter. We don't know very much about such an immense wave because the most powerful earthquakes we have today are about a million times smaller than even a 10 kilometer body would have caused. But we do have an account of waves raised by very much smaller earthquakes. For example, we have a record from an American ship called the Water Re. Disbelief repeatedly gripped a Lieutenant Billing I witnessed the terror of the afternoon of August 13th, 1868. From the side wheeler USS Watery, anchored in the harbour of Arica, Peru, 
now part of Chile. He helplessly watched a nightmare unfold as an earthquake levelled the town. An hour later, the first wave of a tsunami slithered under his vessel and engulfed frantic survivors clustered on the wharf. The waters receded until the harbour floor lay exposed, leaving other ships lying on their beam ends. But the flat-bottomed watery remained upright. A point to notice is that if a wave goes up, the trough behind it goes down. If the wave is higher than the depth of the water, the seabed is left high and dry. The sun had set when the Waterie's lookout spotted the next wave. We made out a thin phosphorescent line rising higher and higher. Below it loomed frightful masses of black water, nearly 15 metres, 50 feet tall. The wave swallowed the watery for a suffocating eternity before depositing her three kilometres inland, high and dry once more. The three mile high wave, sweeping around the world in 27 hours, would have left a whole lot of seabed uncovered for a long time before returning to cover it again. Scientist Edward Anders of the University of Chicago wrote, even if it hit the ocean, the impact would have created a crater 300 kilometres across. A huge plume would have pushed the atmosphere aside. The fireball would have had a radius of several thousand kilometres. Winds of hundreds of kilometres an hour would have swept the planet for hours. So, with fireball temperature winds blowing at hundreds of kilometres an hour, sweeping the whole earth for hours. It would have been quite possible for plenty of sand on the exposed seabed to be dried out and blown into dunes before the next wave arrived to cover them with sediment. Well, there are a few more things that have been claimed to need millions of years, and we haven't got time to look at most of them. But one thing that is just too interesting to leave out is plate tectonics. Let's look at that next time. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.